Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Um, welcome to the lecture on the Chinese photographs of John Thompson. Uh, this is part of the program that links with the exhibition at, currently on at the Brunei Gallery. Um, really, we also have a special welcome for the Chopstick Club members. I think there's a group here tonight. Uh, just a bit of housekeeping before uh, we introduce Michael. Uh, first, could you please uh, silence your mobile phone and also, but Please tweet, send you know Instagram, whatever. Do 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 lots of those things, <laughs> social media. Uh, and also, I do appreciate if you because I don't. It's six o'clock is quite an early start. So can you please bunch in a bit so that the two sides for the latecomers, I'd appreciate that uh, for people to you know don't have to climb over you. And also, um, we're videoing tonight. So I think the the last row, if you. And we'll just get the back of your head. Anyway, so thank you. Our speaker tonight, of course, Michael Wood, really doesn't need any introduction, as I'm sure you are all here because of him, because you know and admire uh, his work uh, as a historian, as a filmmaker, and as a broadcaster. And besides his vast body of work on British, you know, Western history. Many of you uh, would have seen the, I think it's a six part documentary, The Story of China. This is from 2016. This is where I saw and I sort of spotted the title pages had a few images of John Thompson. And that's why I got in touch with Michael because he has an incredibly busy schedule and travel schedule. So we're really greatly honored uh, Michael is here tonight uh, to spend time to speak and to share his thoughts on John Thompson with us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Brett. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, actually, the, the reason there were John Thompson photographs in the films in 2016 was that a year or two or three before, I'd seen your exhibition in Dublin of John Thompson. And uh, Anyway, it's a real pleasure to be here. And big thanks to SOAS, to you, Betty, of course, and, and to the wonderful Welcome Library, without whom, and to whom, of course, Thompson bequeathed his... Uh, his plates back in 1921. It's amazing to think he lived for so long, isn't it? Um, uh, I hope you've seen the exhibition over the road. If you haven't, you're in for an unforgettable treat. Uh, he, he, he had, I think, one exhibition in the UK before, which was at the late lamented National Museum of Photography in 1985, but never in London, and never in China, I think, until <coughs> Betty made it happen with an incredible reaction from the Chinese public, a, a, a deeply emotional reaction to these pictures. You, I hope I'll give you a tiny sense of, of why. I should confess uh, to you, if, if you didn't know already, that I'm not an expert in any of these things, really. I'm neither a historian of China nor a, an expert in the history of uh, photography. Um, but i um, long been interested in Thompson. I'm trying to persuade the BBC to do a documentary about him. I mean, for three years I've been trying, but maybe this exhibition will, will finally clinch it, because he's one of the greatest of all photographers, it seems to me. And, um, and of course, also a pioneer, writer, teacher, publisher on what he called this new art science of photography. Uh, and next month, if you're really in for the, the longer haul on this, as I hope you are. Richard's coming, Richard Ovenden, who wrote a wonderful book on, on Thompson, is coming here to talk about his whole career. Tonight, we're just going to look at some of the, the China photos that made his name. There he is, as a young man. Um, don't know where this was shot. Penang, possibly, is that kind of age. He's in his 20s. Eyes set on the eastern horizon. Uh, a, ch a later Chinese sitter for Thompson wrote about him, uh, the, what an impressive character he was, what a keen mind. Thompson, this is, and he wrote ver lines of verse, Thompson, the visitor from overseas, had piercing eyes, dragon-like whiskers, and a great forehead. <laughs> Charismatic. 
you know, and must have been someone of incredible charm as well as patience and tenacity and stamina to do the things that he did, which I hope to show you. Um, the kind of images we've got of him, very few. Um, there he is with his one new wife in Hong Kong, is it? Um, you know, suggests classic Victorian imperialist, doesn't it? You know, the kind of... Uh, and he's making his money from the elites in Penang and Singapore and Hong Kong. But he's much more than that. He's traveller and explorer and writer who photographs the na indigenous peoples of, of East Asia with real empathy, uh, a real engagement with the lives of the poor and ordinary people and, and with women, as I hope to show you. Uh, and, I, and that's not merely just my subjective or our subjective response to the pictures, because he writes about his subjects too. His notes on individual people within the photographs, sometimes very ordinary people, show you how he felt and he wrote about his subjects. So it's the China end of the story we're going to look at. I ought to give you a few words of background, so you'll have to be patient with me. We won't get on to the four Chinese journeys for a few minutes. Um, he was born, let's just go back to that, shall we? He was born in 1837, um, only a few days before Victoria comes to the throne. So if you think about it this way, he's a younger, only just younger contemporary of Speak and Burton, and some of those famous Victorian explorers who, like him, were also polymaths in a way, translators and uh, writers and scientists as well as explorers. He's an older contemporary of Charles Darwin and an older contemporary of Joseph Conrad. And Richard, in his book, actually describes the arc of um, uh, Thompson's life as Conradian in its sweep, you know. Um, he was of lower middle, lower class background. He apprenticed, these are worth remembering when you see how the life develops. Lower class background, he apprentices at the age of 13 to an Edinburgh family of instrument makers, the horologist James Bryson. They make lenses, scientific instruments. They're also photographers at the very moment of the birth of photography. So right from the beginning, that, that incredible technical ability that he's got when you see him on his travels, it starts to develop the understanding of the properties of lenses, how to construct instruments. And, and here I'm going to sound hopelessly romantic, and, you know, forgive me for being my unscientific language. I think it partly comes from being a five-year-old in our little house in Manchester with my father, who was obsessive about photography, with his own dark room and the chemicals and all this. But it seems to me that um, uh, right at the beginning, there's a, sense, uh, there's a quest for um, the properties of light in somebody like him. You see, these old processes, like the wet collodion process that he uses, they involve skills that are both technical and, um, dare one say, intuitive. They're, they're chemical, but, you know, alchemical. Um, they are physical, but also metaphysical. The, the combination of emulsions and chemicals and salts and time, carefully measured time, are the means by which light can be harnessed or depicted or preserved, you know. I mean, that's a very romantic way of saying it. But, but my point is that this doesn't come by accident. This comes from a seven-year apprenticeship with people who are in lenses, optics, opticians, uh, instrument making and photography. From the age of 19, let's move him on now. Let's have a look at this incredible picture. I have no idea where the Fife volunteers were, what uh, his relation to them was. That's him on the left, putting on the look of the grown up boys. He attends evening classes at the Edinburgh School of Arts, the predecessor of Harriet Watt. He does natural philosophy, and natural philosophy it then equals optics, magnetism, electricity, heat, the new sciences of the early Victorian age. And, you know, you get a sense of how his competence builds and builds. Although where his language competence came from, I can't tell you either, because he translates scientific books from French and from Spanish histories of photography, adding 
uh, the, the translations of new, uh, new terminology for the scientific terminology of cameras. He even helps on the first publication of the history of photography, uh, the, or the, the, um, the, the methods of photography in Chinese. So uh, where that all comes from, who knows. But he's born, this is the other moment of his background that is worth remembering, at the very moment of the birth of photography, um, Daguerre's first practical process is announced in Paris two years after his birth. Fox Talbot has already been producing negatives back in, in, uh, in, in the mid-1830s. Uh, and Edinburgh is the centre of all this. There are many photographers in Edinburgh at that time. And uh, his art school library held a copy of Le Rebourg's Treatise on Photography from 1843, which he, we know he read and which influenced him in that sensational series of photographs from Cambodia that you can see in the exhibition. Edinburgh, my last bit of his introduction, also has direct contacts with China from the 1830s. The first clippers are docking at Leith in the 1830s. They're bringing tea, silk, cotton, ceramics. Um, uh, you could... You know, they published a history of China in Edinburgh in 1834, which he knew. So you can see, it's not only the science and it's not only the knowledge, but it's the flavours and smells and textures that you could access by going down to the docks in Leith, the lure for talent to go east. Now, historians often look at the British Empire in, in terms of the peoples of the UK, in terms of an interlocking circle of many empires, the Irish, especially with the armies of the empire, the English with the navy, the Cornish in mining, for example, and the Scots empire in the 19th century, especially rich in scientists, botanists, doctors, experts in optics, mechanics, seeking their fortune out east. That's what he goes to do. Um, we we'll need to say a little bit more about the, the China that he went to. But the China that he went to, and I've just marked on here some of the key places we're going to be looking at. We'll have more detailed maps of his journeys later. Um, has just gone through cataclysms. Uh, they've had the 16-year war of the Taiping, in which 20 million people are thought to have died. <coughs> and although the rebellion is crushed in... Uh, uh, the mid-1860s uh, at its capital of Nanjing. The fighting rebel armies continue until the early 1870s. So he's actually there while these, this war is still being fought. And um, this is after two opium wars fought by the British, extorting their colonies and their treaty ports and their punitive um, exactions from the Qing government. These kind of events were the fledgling art of photography, was also recording. In fact, a lot of the photography that came out of the East in the first 20 years of photography concerned the actions of the empire. This is by Felix Beato, and it's the depiction of the aftermath of what the British called the Great Indian Mutiny uh, in 1857-58, and um, a lot of Beato's photographs depict the reality of war, the aftermath of war. Um, the residents at Lucknow, uh, there were stories afterwards that these bones had been exhumed from an ossuary by the, in order for the photographer to take this picture. Uh, but he... But he also depicted the, 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 um, the reprisals, and he also depicted the Second Opium War. And these are shots Beato took in China in the Second Opium War, uh, the Taku forts. Uh, these images were the images that went back with images, too, of the power of the uh, Allied armies assisting the Qing armies 
uh, fighting against the Taiping rebels, these incredible photographs of the, the berms and the defensive embankments of these forces. The ever victorious army included among them, which was a, a, a Chinese regiment in the Qing army commanded by European officers including Charles Gordon, Gordon of Khartoum. And it's interesting that uh, Thompson's first book that he actually published um, was um, a photographic record of the ever victorious army to go with a, a, a book about it that wasn't illustrated. So um, that's one background to this story which you can't, you, one mustn't forget. The, um, uh, we're in a high tide of imperialism. Uh, Hong Kong, 1860s. Um, and one of his photographs. Background to this is he'd gone out, first of all, in 1861, aged 24, to visit his brother, William, in Singapore, who'd been a, um, was a watchmaker and also a photographer. It was a big market for photographers in the new uh, colonial elites in these fledgling colonies. After all, the Brits had only got Hong Kong in 1842 from, by the Nanjing Treaty. There were 7,000 people there then, and by the time he got there, there's more than 80,000 in, in such a short time. It's a, a booming place. And, uh, um, and he returns, goes out for a brief time, but then returns in 1862 and settles first in Penang, where he starts to develop his portraiture. And he's already very interesting, because he wrote about that moment um, I'm photo he wrote back to Britain I'm photographing everybody descendants of the early Portuguese voyagers he says with a smile Chinese, Malays Parsis, Arabs Armenians Klings that's people from Kalinga the east coast of India Bengalis and Africans um, so he's already starting to get interested in the street, if I can put it that way, even though he's making a lot of his money from, you know, the high ups in colonial society, he produces a book of photographs of the royal tour, uh, uh, and so on. Uh, and then he does his great journey to Cambodia, which we're not going to talk about today. 1866, the rumours of these great uh, ruins in the Cambodian jungle uh, take him there. A gruelling journey, he had ten porters, an interpreter. He came back with malaria, which plagued him during his life, as well as the staggering images you can see over the road. Um, and at that point, you'd guess he's still a kind of typical European, an Orientalist in his reaction to the indigenous cultures. Talks about the apathy of the people in Southeast Asia, and he goes to Vietnam, Cambodia, and to Siam. He approves the French colonial influence in Indochina. Um, but he's starting to change, I think. And in late 1867, he comes here to Hong Kong and settles here. This, some of his photographs. You see, you see how swiftly the Europeans had created their own, um, their own world on the island. Um, at a point when the Taiping armies are still fighting in parts of the mainland south across the water. He marries here in late 869, uh, sorry, 1869, uh, Isabel Petrie, the daughter of Manx Scots, and has a baby boy. And his business is taking off, um, but his real goal is to go into the interior of China. And um, here I should say another word or two about background. China, of course, was not a dark continent, a blank on the map, as Conrad had imagined Africa, or would imagine Africa, but a vast ancient civilization, cities far bigger than anywhere in the West. Um, but, due, but due to restrictions on travel, um, the interior was still relatively unknown to Westerners uh, until after 1860, the Second Opium War, uh, treat, more treaty ports were established and, and, and the possibilities of travel were uh, really opened up. And before we 
look in detail about at his, his journeys, just put a few of these pictures in, which are not among his most celebrated photographs, but convey something which he saw and which he records in a lot of his photographs, which is that China at that point was going into a period of crisis and a period of decline. And in terms of the infrastructure, in terms of the local bureaucracies and the tide, rising tide of poverty, um, he sees that everywhere and he photographs it. Um, the great age of the Qing dynasty, this is the last great imperial dynasty of China, of course, it had been the 18th century. They'd taken Mongolia, um, Xinjiang, Tibet. Uh, China had reached its greatest extent. They were the greatest civilization in the world. They had the highest standard of living probably than anywhere else. Uh, an extraordinary stability. They had three rulers ruled 116 years between them over the 18th century. The last of whom, Qianlong, had met the McCartney Embassy in 1793 in, near Beijing. So um, uh, still assured that China was the center of the world. But from the early 1800s, this begins to change uh, with what historians have termed the Great Divergence. As the West starts to go ahead, the Industrial Revolution, technological advance and so on, and China becomes left behind. There's more to it than that, but we can't go into it in detail just now. But this crisis in China, um, the impact of the West, um, the failures of the, the bureaucratic system which seem to happen in the current cycles in the dynasties of China, but above all, and it's really evident in his photographs and his writings, the population crisis. China's population doubles under the Qing to 450 million. Um, the farm, loss of farmland became massive in the early 19th century. Between the 1750s and the 1810s, it's been calculated the per capita acreage declined by nearly half to less than half an acre per person. So you get a huge population rise, you get massive poverty, huge amount of unemployment, itinerant labor, and when you couple that with a bureaucracy which is becoming increasingly kind of ossified despite all the talent in the system, um, the country which started the, uh, the early 19th century as the greatest in the world is in a path of decline in which at the center of which is the rural problem as the standard of li living goes. And, and he constantly remarks on this in his photographs. Um, the, um, uh, you know, he photographs uh, foundling hospitals. This is one that he shoots in Xiamen in Fujian. Uh, uh, and he notes in his annotations to, to the, in, in his book in which this is reproduced, the extreme poverty uh, caused by, in part by war uh, in Fujian, and he's, this is the aftermath of the Taiping, has led to a huge increase in female infanticide, for example, he says. And uh, in this town, a local merchant whom he records created this founding hospital to care for unwanted children. Girls could be sold to the hospital for a mere five pence, he said. <coughs> Boys for up to three pounds and if you were a respectable person without children and you went to these foundling hospitals you could take the child away as your own for free but he's recording what is a very big fact in the life of China here um, he records um, uh, the nature of itinerant labor these are again in Fujian and um, these, these local laborers who at the time, he says, were often known as rebels. And of course, it was a lot of the disinherited, dis, um, um, the poor rural workforce, the miners and some people like that who had joined the Taiping Rebellion, which was still continuing in some places in the countryside. But um, these were the people who the British called coolies. And these were people who, uh, Thompson notes, uh, were in, in many of these coastal towns leaving to go to America to uh, work in, in uh, plantations in Southeast Asia and the Philippines. You know, they, they, these, are, these are difficult conditions. He records poor families in Kowloon. And what's amazing about his passage on these people here, this particular family, he talks about 
their poverty, uh, due, due to their poverty, their insufficient and unwholesome food, the humid atmosphere, a temperature of 90 degrees in the shade, uh, account in great measure for the frequent visits of cholera and the black plague, uh, the lack of sanitation, he, he said, examples of which can be found much nearer home <coughs> in the centres of congested population in our own great cities in Britain. And of course he will come back and do his, the record he's most famous for, which is his account of the East End poor. It could almost be Friedrich Engels in Manchester, that passage. Um, so, um, uh, I'm just trying to give you a sense of uh, the way his interests start to go. It's not that he isn't a vic classic Victorian imperialist in some ways, but what will distinguish his work is the humanity. His China travels begin in earnest in the summer of 1870. That June, concerned about her and her child's health, his pregnant wife sails for England, and it's at this point he embarks on a series of major journeys through China, which give him all his, the greatest photographs. And, and we go, we'll look at four of these. Uh, Pearl River, uh, they're marked here, the Min River near Fuzhou, uh, uh, the Yangtze, and the northern journey up to Beijing. Uh, he does many, many more. He seems to constantly be taking steamers up these coasts. He's a freelancer. He's not employed by the government. He's not in hock to anybody. He's got enough money from his business to, uh, to do what he wants to do. So he's driven by a quest, by curiosity, by a desire to record. And he's forever taking the boats up and down this coast, <coughs> the steamships that regularly ply up and down there. And this is, these are some images from his first... Uh, series of journeys in the North River, in uh, the Pearl River. Bearing the marks of the plates as they have survived in the Welcome Library. <coughs> he gets very interested in Chinese landscapes and the effect of Chinese landscapes. And you look at some of these and you wonder whether had he seen Chinese landscape painting? Is this only a Western eye? Or is he trying to see it as they saw it? Um, the portraiture is, well, go and see the exhibition. To see these things blown up this size, is, they're, they're, they're amazing images. But uh, uh, here is, is uh, and he tells you about their lives. Zhu Rui Lin, the governor of Guangdong, 1869 a man greatly admired by the foreigners for his courtesy and what they felt was a genuine desire to establish good relations with the foreigners despite the fact of the opium wars and everything else that had happened. You know. uh, and um, Wonderful quality, isn't there, to the... He takes these pictures even of, uh, you know, the Buddhist abbot in the local temple fussing over his geraniums, you know. Um, he takes portraits of <coughs> merchants who, in the scale of Chinese society, were not highly reputed then, of course, not, not high up in the scale of things, merchants. You know, they've been very looked down on in the Ming dynasty and not, uh, uh, you know, in their status had improved under the Qing. And now, of course, you know, um, Alibaba's ancestors here, <laughs> you know. Uh, and he describes these people and their character. He observes, he talks a lot about the children, for example. He talks about the education system and how um, there were many flaws in the education system, he says. It, it's too traditional. It's too based on the Confucian learning. You learn, you learn all this stuff by rote. But how impressive was the diligence and attitude of the children and their learning abilities. And he notes that Western learning coming in, is coming in in some of the towns he visits. You know, the Chinese are in a headlong attempt to try and adjust to the impact of the West, what was called the modernization program which went from building naval dockyards uh, on a Western model in Fuzhou to adopting you know, Western military gear in Nanjing. He photographs it, I'll show you in a minute, and even bringing in some Western ideas about education. Um, but 
it's a gorgeous, gorgeous portrait, isn't it? Some of these people come to him through friends, through contacts. Many of them he meets just by chance. We'll see examples of them. Um, and he just cannot resist the street. There's, there's seven or eight hundred, I can't remember how many, there are negatives in uh, uh, plates in, in the welcome. And there are others in other collections in the world, but that's the greatest collection which he gave to them. But the street he keeps coming back to, gamblers. This is a set-up photograph, of course. It doesn't look like a studio, but um, there's a certain... How would you describe that look? A certain tough, <laughs> devil-may-care, this is thing of that gambler. And some of the portraits of women. <coughs> he loved the boat, the boat people of Fujian. He loved their freedom, despite their poverty. There's a great description of one boatman, he said, who had the most radiant face and who always was smiling and always was singing. Though what he had to sing about, only a philosopher greater than I could possibly imagine the harshness of their lives. And, but he loved the, the boat people. And he does several versions of this photograph of a Fujian boat woman. Great, isn't it? Yeah, it is, yeah. Cheeky. <laughs> yeah. Um, it takes a minute or two, I think, with the collodion process for the... For the, um, the whole process, you've got to do it in 15 minutes before the, the, the plates dry. You know, but the actual photograph, I think, takes... Experts here, perhaps. You've got to stay still for a good couple of minutes. And, but he extracts some magical vivacity, doesn't he, from, from these fabulous photographs. Um, and some of them so touching. Um, this is a, a maid, effectively a slave, from, um, from Guangzhou. Very ordinary person. And he will shoot ordinary people right down to the poorest beggars on the streets in, in uh, Guangdong. But she's in, perhaps in the house where she works. She's going out to the shops for her mistress. He tells you all about them, often gives you their names. You can see the pillars. It's a slightly Western-style house in Guangdong uh, of some wealthy Chinese merchant or somebody. Uh, the screen on the other side. She's about to go off on an errand. She's got her fan, which gives the photograph a beautiful kind of um, shape, doesn't it? And um, the tenderness of the face is just... Okay. The next southern journey is the River Min here, which is... We didn't mark Fuzhou in here, but Fuzhou's there. And the Min goes into the mountains. And this was a series of landscapes that he, he um, his pursuit of the landscape starts to get really interesting. Um, they're just, um, he had two faithful Chinese servants who'd been with him from the beginning and who stayed with him for the, till the end. And on some of these great pictures, uh, you, he's probably asked one of them to go and stand on that rock. Are you going to stand on that rock just there? And... and um, this river flows down uh, from the interior of Fujian and, and um, they're just incredible pictures. This is, this is in the exhibition and this is the state of the plate as it is now. But here's a scan of when he published this wonderful book called Fuzhou and the River Min of which only 47 copies were made. They hadn't mastered the techniques yet of, of printing the um, uh, album and paper. That, so they're, they're actually gluing them into albums here. But that's the image in the, in the book. And when you look close at it, every grain in the kind of wood of the balcony is just kind of, I mean, staggering stuff, isn't it? And it was a famous landmark in the River Min, and quite a lot of people photographed it, but... Um, uh, nobody, and it's actually joined to the, the bank, the other side, but nobody had just got round to take that. And uh, again, is he, 
What's he thinking in his composition of landscape there? I don't know. Um, he goes into, further into the mountains, uh, visits lonely Buddhist monasteries, places of pilgrimage. This was a place where he said he slept for four or five nights and eats with the, the monks. And uh, must have had translators with him, usually travels with other people, often uh, hitches up with missionaries, Protestant missionaries, um, and uh, who would speak the language. And the dialect down there, of course, is its own world. Uh, I'm sure he picked up some Chinese, judging by his contributions to other people's books. But, um, and again, you know, the blind monk at his table. I mean, that could be a scene from a, a Du Mu poem from, <laughs> from the 850s, you know, sitting, waiting to go into the refectory in a lonely Buddhist monastery with the old monk who's seen it all. The Buddhist way, they say, takes a thousand years. <laughs> and, um, so as you can see, some of these are wonderful, um, <coughs> wonderful compositions of landscape. Some of them are um, remarkable personal portraiture. And some of them capture, um, seem to capture a moment, except you know that it's, they've had to stand there for a couple of minutes for that shot, but it's... They're smiling. They know him. And he goes on up into the interior. And, um, uh, you know, these, that, this landscape, and we know quite a lot about it in the mid-19th century. There's quite a lot of evidence from the local gazetteers, uh, some inscriptional evidence that tells you about the lives of the ordinary folk up in these valleys, you know, how tough things were how things had declined in the previous 20 or 30 years, how um, uh, the exactions of the government in ra raising taxes that had been fixed in the previous reign were, just couldn't be met, how crooked local administrators were using f fake weighing scales to you know, take more than their quota of grain, and how in one inscription how the villagers uh, uh, of Tyning had been um, uh, defended by a local an ordinary local magistrate who'd fought for them and, and got the central government to change the, what was happening there and they directed a steely to, um, to commemorate this loyal local magistrate who'd been full of humanity and it's still there, you know, fantastic. Um, he records their kind of communities and even uh, traditional uh, places, sacred places. This is the altar of heaven in, in a site in the Min Valley, which he, he, was, he describes in some detail as a place of pilgrimage by the local people of the indigenous religion. And again, these great portraits, um, sometimes just snatched, if you can ever snatch with a tripod and a wet collodion <laughs> camera, but um, a shopkeeper on a balmy night in the, the Min River Just great, isn't it? I mean, so human. And these are the kind of people who are described in those inscriptions, the, the ordinary folk, uh, n native people. You know, a lot of, in the south of China, there are many indigenous peoples and uh, who were lower down the social scale, often performing uh, the, the menial tasks. And wherever he could, he records them. And all through his career in China, astounding access to women, as we'll see when we get to Beijing on the other end of the social scale. All, uh, not all these images, but the best ones are in, in um, Betty's book, which I really, really strongly recommend you to, to get. And he crosses over to Taiwan, Formosa, the beautiful island, as, as um, the Portuguese had called it. And... Uh, um, where he meets an old Scottish friend from Edinburgh, James Maxwell, who's a, a missionary doctor out there, who acts as his translator with the local dialects in, in uh, Taiwan. And they stay with the indigenous people, even though he'd been told, you mustn't do that, they're cannibals, they kind of, all shipwrecked sailors get eaten alive, and everything. but he had a great time and found them very, very hospitable. Again, it's a whole other story, almost. But... Um, uh, 
those images of the ordinary people stay with you from this, this part of his journey. The poor folk who the, 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 gazete the government gazetteer, the local gazetteers, the inscriptions, the historians, um, only give you a tiny sense of their lives. But, and of course, um, he's interested in, as a lot of Western commentators were in, in, um, in foot binding. He records that for his Western audience. Um, I remember meeting a woman in Kaifeng in, in um, 1984 who, who, who still had bound, bound feet. And because um, it's easy to, to censure from our lofty position, but uh, what women do to their bodies in the West today is that any less awful than, than this? I, 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 I don't know um, uh, what is done to women's bodies. Anyway, that's the point. So, um, third of these great journeys is he goes up to Beijing. And you, he, you remember he's been based in Hong Kong. He's based himself sometime in Fuzhou. The business is still ticking over, although he will sell that. He goes up to Shanghai. And then uh, at some point um, in 1872... I probably can tell you exactly when, but um, summer 1871, sells his business, and he sails, he goes up to Shanghai, and then 1,300-mile boat journey <laughs> to Tianjin, and uh, a short overland journey to Beijing, and uh, an incredible, amazing experience. He's mesmerized by it. I do not have the space, he says in one of his letters, to relate a tenth of what I beheld or experienced in this great city. And of course, you read any of the great foreign guidebooks to Beijing in the 19th, early 20th century, um, you get a sense of if Constantinople and Rome kind of compared, <laughs> they in no way and really came up to the unbelievable uh, life of this great city. Uh, there you are, the great walls, sadly demolished and very short-sightedly demolished by Mao in the 1950s. Um, uh, the enormous shanties outside. The, there's the Manchu city, it's still the Manchu um, Empire, of course, the, the rulers. Uh, the Chinese city, and then outside, enormous shanties of the poor the great ceremonial uh, rows of uh, uh, lanes and rows. Um, he stays in the foreign quarter, the legation quarter. Um, he records the... He goes out to the Great Wall. Wonderful image. And he, dis he records the destruction of the Summer Palace by the Br British and French forces in the Second Opium War in photographs that are really extraordinary. Even the ones that had not been demolished by the, and looted by the Allied armies uh, a few years before, now overgrown and abandoned. Uh, the giant terraces, their buildings smashed. Their contents looted, of course. They still, up, still come up for sale in... Western sail rooms. The great temple on the terrace here destroyed, only its pagoda surviving. Um, he records all this. <clears throat> and now he's got access, he's got a name, you know, and he's got access to some of the, the leading people. This is Prince Gong, who was the um, younger brother of the old emperor. We've now got a child emperor here, of course. But um, Gong was a modernizer, pro-Western. Um, Thompson was impressed by him, quick of apprehension, always open to advice, he said, and comparatively liberal in his views. It's uh, um, Thompson's view, what exactly that means in 1871. <laughs> um, but some of these shots are... I, I love these shots. There's a humanity to these images, even when they're great figures of state. These are the three great ministers of the Qing Empire in the Foreign Office. Um, 
the, the, the guy on the left, uh, Shan Guifeng, would have been a famous uh, fighter in the anti-opium policy. Um, he was a mod part of the modernizing movement that it, we've got to move China on, you know. Uh, and, and these were really hard-working uh, men of state wear simple robes, they're not tarted, you can see from their clothes, they're not tarted up, they're simply sitting there outside their office, if you like. And <laughs> Thompson says, they were as fine-looking men as ever our own cabinet could boast. <laughs> <laughs> and all of them had an air of quiet, dignified repose. And the middle guy, Dong Xu, uh, who he did some fabulous um, portraits on, just single portraits, one of them with his long pipe smoking, um, he, he was especially impressed by, because he, uh, uh, he was into science and technology, and he was really uh, trying to devise plans to improve irrigation and drainage across China to, to bump up, to, to, to modernize the state by bumping up agricultural production, and, and um, um, Thompson liked him, Thompson liked him. Uh, but he goes out into the street, he can't resist the street. So I'm, I'm, as you can tell now, I'm not talking to any script, so I must, must, um, I must watch the time. He goes out into the street, he just bumps into people, the knife grinder, The guy who comes round with grapes round the houses and the hutongs shouting out, Fresh grapes, fresh grapes, come down, come down. You can see his origin is probably one of the southern tribal peoples, isn't it? A Muslim cook, this fabulous series, fabulous series of shots around one of the great markets in, in uh, Beijing with Mongolian traders and their camels and their tents, you know. They put the animals in the barns and they sleep out of, out of doors, you know. And, and, and they're obviously street corners. And we do the same as filmmakers, actually. I remember when we were filming Story of China in Suzhou and we had a wonderful street corner. There was canals, <coughs> there was a hutong, there was an old Ming merchant's house and there was a stall where the hot pancakes were made first thing in the morning. And it just became a wonderful focus for images. And he does the same. Uh, it, it, there's a little cluster of them all around this particular neighborhood. Uh, it, this is great, isn't it? A Muslim butcher. Muslims often butchers in the markets of, uh, of, of Beijing. Just great. With his assistant. Um, and they make pan they make they put the, they do meat pancakes and the the, the, the young boy's the assistant rolls the dough, and the, uh, you know every life has a story. Even the rag and bone man, poor <coughs> poor guy who literally lives on scraps. And you could say, well, it's a bit like imperialist orientalist photography. You know, he's he's uh, he's um, working in the framework of those Victorian ideas about ethnic types, you know, the kind of stuff you have in Victorian literature. I, I, I see more than that in this. I, I don't know, how should I know, but I, I, I think most of us have seen these. And, he's, and the women in Beijing, um, very interesting. This, this one, an ordinary woman, not at the poorest levels of society, but you can see from her clothes and the clothes of her kids, um, an ordinary uh, woman, um, uh, and he says that he'd met her outside the butcher's shop. He'd met her outside the Muslim butcher's shop, and he'd asked her to, would she stand for a photo for him? There's even somebody just walking into the shop just there. Can you see? Or maybe just sitting in the shop. And then he goes behind the scenes in the women's quarters, and here's a bunch of well-to-do Manchu women connected with the, the royal imperial establishment, probably got to them through Prince Gong or one of those top guys who he'd photographed. And uh, here they are having a meal in their courtyard. The servants are there standing there. The women are talking. It looks like a frozen moment, doesn't it? It's incredible that you could capture that in the way he's done. And some of these portraits are well, 
very, very touching. The Manchu Bride, that's become known as, hasn't it? It's a haunting picture. And he talks about the, um, writes at some length about the life that she had to look forward to. And remarks that in some sense the slave women who go on their errands are freer than the, than the wives in that Manchu imperial compound. Um, that's his own scribbles on the top of the plate. Extraordinarily powerful human record, don't you think? I mean, this one, just amazingly touching. She's looking down, she's in the garden, um, almost floating. And that kind of uh, sadness in her face, it's extraordinary, isn't it? Glim a glimpsed moment. But achieved by a process that doesn't allow you to glimpse. That's the, the crazy thing, isn't it? Um, okay. And then the next year, um, he makes his Yangtze journey in um, 1872, the summer. And he goes by um, a scheduled steamer from Shanghai up to what they called Hong Kong, which is now part of Wuhan, so I'm not Wuhan in for it. Sometimes in the books you'll see a confusion. Um, uh, in Richard's book, for example, he's going to Hangzhou, which of course is completely the wrong direction. Hangzhou's on the, the, the river below Shanghai there. It's Hong Kong, uh, and uh, uh, that's the point where the steamers the regular steams, that's as far as the steam services go on, um, on the Yangtze, um, the ancient uh, fortified town of Wuchang, shown on all the old maps. And from there he sets off on local transport, uh, a journey which is actually all, it's all another six or seven hundred miles by river. Uh, I'll put this in, I don't think the boat would have been that big on the, the middle Yangtze, but um, it just gives you a sense. He's now on a local boat on local transport with two American companions. I dare say one of them was uh, um, they spoke better Chinese than John did. But uh, and uh, I'd love to know more about this journey. It's an, uh, you know he he's very writes very amusingly about the married couple, Mr. and Mrs. Wang, who are the captain and his wife on the boat, and and and. John and his two friends are a narrow bulkhead separated from, from the husband and wife over, you know, several weeks of travel. And uh, Mrs. Wang's voice, he said, would cut the air before, before you really wanted to wake up, you know. And the, and the worst thing about it was they smoked stale tobacco long into the night, which pervaded our chamber to the point where one could hardly sleep. <laughs> and uh, anyway, there, there's, uh, there's his boat. Uh, that's what it looked like when you unloaded all your photographic gear. Can you see that? That's the photographic gear all bagged up. You're taking it off from the boat to photograph a landscape. And the effort that it takes just to make one great photograph. So he must have assistance with him along with the boys on the boat. And because the boys on the boat that Mr. and Mrs. Wang are the captains of, the kind of people you still meet on the Grand Canal today, by the way. I mean, I've been on a barge on the Grand Canal with a married couple, and a lot of people, you know, they live on the boat. They have a garden on the boat. They grow um, herbs for their food and all that stuff. So that's what it's like on long-distance travel still on, on, on the great uh, river arteries of China. But um, they've also got the boys, and the boys, when you can't, the wind's against you, they take the long ropes out and they pull the boat. And there's the cabin. Oh, there he is. <coughs> Quite nice, actually, isn't it? See the carved wooden... 
but this is their living room, not their bedroom. And you see how well wrapped up they are. It was absolutely freezing, he says, um, freezing at night. Uh, in his description of it, it resembles nothing more than, well, Richard Overton compared it to the Conradian journey for me. It's a bit like, do you remember Philip Pullman's Dark Materials and the, 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 the journey up to the Arctic and the, uh, the armoured bears? It's that sort of thing. It was freezing. Let the reader imagine, says Thompson. Let the reader imagine himself afloat in such a vessel as I have described, on a river red like the soil through which it flows. We're up out of the countryside now. And from half a mile to a league in breadth, three miles. Let him conceive himself ascending the stream between low, monotonous clay walls. He will then have a picture of our craft and our surroundings for many days as we pursued our voyage towards the gorges. That's where he's heading. He gets into the uh, mid-February, 18th of February, he reaches Wushan, Sichuan province, 12 or 1,300 miles by river from Shanghai, and you enter the scenery of the gorges. Um, and... Uh, uh, well, I put this in because this is a kind of legendary place in Chinese culture. This is the place where China's greatest poet, Du Fu, um, on his penultimate journey, lived in his thatched hut and wrote 400 poems before his final journey to um, um, Changsha and his death. Uh, so uh, uh, there's a lot of great Chinese literature about this place. Did he know any of that stuff? I mean, you don't really need to know this, but um, uh, John Davis's book on Chinese poetry was published by the East India Company Press in Macau in 1834 with transcriptions. And did he know any of this? It was a famous landmark. Um, I love the, I love the uh, range of. Photography, don't you? The, the um, uh, intimacy of the portraiture and the staggering vistas. And I've not even in this, because I'm trying to stitch a few pictures together to tell you a story, I've not even chosen some of his best, almost famous pictures, perhaps. But there you are entering the gorges. And of course you can't see this anymore because of the Three Gorges Dam. Um, but, um, okay, so he leaves that behind. He sails back down, gets off, goes to Nanjing, um, where, I just added this, the world is being restored for the moment. The great imperial city, the capital of the Ming, the capital of the Taiping rebels, have been devastated. He spe speaks about square miles of the interior of the city, which has got 30 odd miles of circuit walls being completely leveled by the warfare and the destruction and everywhere rebuilding. And he photographed a bit of the rebuilding. And that photograph reminds me of what you see everywhere in China today, which is a sort of <laughs> antiquities being <laughs> rebuilt in the same dreadful style. <laughs> Whilst, um, um, you know, and he even goes up onto the battlements to see the arrival of Western artillery, Gatling guns and all that. He even sets himself up demonstrating one just for the fun of it. Okay, um, we're almost there. Um, and that's pretty much the end of his Chinese story. He's 35 years old. Nel mezzo del cammin di nostra vita, as Dante said. Uh, had he agreed to go back home? Had he told Isabel, give me 10 years. Let me do the Yangtze. And then I'll bring all the pictures back. The kids will be, I'll, I'll see the kids grow up. They had more kids. He loved his family life. Um, was that the deal? He never goes to the East again. In fact, he hardly travels again, really. Although he lives virtually 50 years more. It wasn't the El Mezzo del Camino of his life at all. Um, had it taken a lot out of him? Was the malaria something that constantly dogged him? We don't know. Um, back in London, he 
It publishes the lovely Fujo and the River Min. If you can get a copy now, it probably cost you half a million pounds. I don't know. I don't know. This one went not 2012 for 350,000. Um, and then he runs a 600 print run of China and its people. A novel experiment, he says. Only years before, the photograph was so perishable, so difficult to reproduce. And now the art is so far advanced, we can reproduce many copies with the same felicity, f facility. Sorry. The nearest approach that can be made to placing the reader actually before the scene which is reproduced. And he also adds, the Chinese people themselves, as you'll see in this book, are in many respects the most interesting and the most remarkable race on the face of the earth. It made his name, it made his name. He does all sorts of other things, translates books on photography, um, becomes a major figure in London society. Um, imagine that. That's a different man from the one we saw in the opening picture, isn't it? The marks of life on him, perhaps, although he's only 35. Or is his nervousness, will this picture work as I'm standing here and not behind the camera? <laughs> um, and 1881, his status is celebrated by becoming by appointment to Queen Victoria herself. Just pot all those. The man who'd slept in Buddhist monasteries in the Ming River and cannibal villages in Formosa, so they claimed, who'd photographed and talked to and recorded the lives of slaves and boat women, who'd shivered in a rat-infested junk on the Yangtze wreathed in stale tobacco smoke, now has tea in Windsor. <laughs> Who could have foretold 40 years ago, he recalled in 1877, that the modest, sensitive plate was destined to play a part so important in the history of progress. In all those travels, he'd had no government role, no official status. He was essentially just a lone traveller, driven, sustained by uh, strength of character, curiosity, the desire to travel, and the desire to see. And I hope you've seen from this, and you'll see even more if you go to <coughs> Betty's wonderful exhibition, that um, it's one of the great bodies of work in the history of photography. Um, uh, a final word from a non-expert, if I may add my own thoughts, and this is purely subjective. And if Thompson were here tonight, he'd probably say, oh, come off it, you know. Um, that's not what was in my mind at all. But when you see these photos, Thompson had been privileged to see and immerse himself in one of the most extraordinary spectacles in, in human civilization, a great classical civilization, still alive in all its beauty and cruelty and vitality, its diversity, its inequality, its strengths, its weaknesses, its princes and mandarins, street vendors and gamblers and peep shows and camel drivers and boatmen and slaves. He'd seen and been immersed in that and recorded it. He had no reason to think that all of this, this 2,000 year empire would collapse in, in only a few decades. And that much of the traditional culture, not all, but much of the traditional culture he'd recorded, high and low, would be swept away in the 20th century by civil war and foreign invasion and revolution and, and by the subsequent tide of materialism since. But he tried hard to record it high and low in all its humanity. And uh, I think the, the reaction to, to Betty's exhibition in China just shows you that he was successful in that. Um, people of China have gained much from the amazing successes of the last 40 years in lifting so many hundreds of millions out of the poverty that Thompson portrayed. But at the same time, I think you can't really see these pictures without a sense of loss sense of this world whose roots laid so deep in history and prehistory, the creation of so many generations of ancestors, a world that through all the upheavals of history had come down to our time, um, that it, it's gone. 
But as for the spirit of the people he portrayed so luminously, as anybody will know who travels in China today, that still survives, and Thompson would still recognize the world of the people that he portrayed so powerfully 150 years ago. Michael, what a moving and such a vivid talk. Um, it's really your, your breadth of knowledge and, and you've added so much to this context of the life of, of, of John Thompson, setting in the times, much more than what we can do in the exhibition. Um, you spoke straight from the heart. That's very sweet of you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so, as Michael said, because of the space, uh, my co-curator, Marissa Chakabong here, and I both had to curate a much smaller show. So both the books, As I Am, which is wonderful, it's rarely seen, never seen, really. Uh, maybe the China's toured more. Uh, so uh, the books have a lot more plates in them. Uh, but what we'd like to do now is maybe take a couple of short questions and then will all, Nerissa, Michael and I will move to the Brunei Gallery. So let's not get stuck here because they close at eight and what we'd like to do is to continue to chat and take some questions over there. So all three of us will be there. So shall we have one or two? No or none? <laughs> Question? Oh, oh, let's do it. Jim. Is there any suggestion that he made the sitters or is it all gratuitous? We learned that the sitters are a bit suspicious of cameras. Uh, certainly, when he goes up river, he says that they, uh, uh, he almost caused a riot in one or two places where people, they'd got some idea that camera would, you know, take their soul or you know that it was a threat to them, and um, um, he felt in danger. At that point. I mean, he was in danger in quite a few places actually. I mean, they, were, he, they took guns with them on the Yangtze and fired them to ward off pirates at one point. So. They had to protect themselves in one or two cases. Don't know whether he pays them. It's, it's debatable. Yeah. So we, there was some, someone said about the, the uh, bound foot. Maybe yeah. he had to pay. Yeah. But I think quite often it's through, through friends, through people who knew, for instance, this, um, uh, the Manchu official, he's yeah. actually a rich yeah. man, but he taught him something about photography. Mm -hmm. So in exchange, mm -hmm. he was able to photograph mm -hmm. his family, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm. Um, in a lot of these places, you don't get that impression when he stays in the monastery and he, he you know, eats with the monks for four or five days. I, I don't get any impression that that's the relationship because he's not taking photographs all the time. He's actually experiencing life. You know, I mean, it su takes surprisingly few photos. Really, uh, it's a long process to take a photo, and um, so he's quite careful about choosing his moment. But when he meets the lady with her kids outside the butcher's shop and ask her to <coughs> pose, did he give her a small... We don't know. Mm. No. Don't know. Don't know. Yes. Uh, yes. Is there any evidence that any of his photographs remained in China or indeed in Siam? During the 19th? He no, certainly in left... Siam, he, he, I don't know. He, not in, not in um, Siam, but in, he definitely left stuff in Hong Kong, didn't he? He didn't okay. take and, everything and, back. And there are a lot of things in, in Singapore that, that <coughs> is a mystery yeah. that's lost, so, yeah. because his brother was near too good, so yeah. Yeah, we don't know what happened to them. Spent so there's a lot of material lost. Six months he spent in yeah. Penang in that mm. first year, didn't he? Mm. Um, so I don't know whether Narissa knows. There's a lot of stuff that he shot that we... Yeah. Mm. Uh -huh. That's been lost. That's been know? lost. Yeah. Well, that was the condition. Apparently, yeah. got permission yeah. to go and do the photography. Yeah. He had to bring back a set, and King yeah. of was amazed by the um, Cambodian temple thing called Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. But mm. that's gone. Yeah. Mm. So there are issues about what happened. It's very unlikely that they'd turn up. The mm. big collection, the Eastman collection in America, have got mm. um, 
uh, some, yeah, some plates, the, haven't they? From, University of Massachusetts, so yeah. Penang. There are collections um, in other places, nothing yes. like this. but yeah. um, we, we do have a, um, a PhD student researching on John Thompson as part of the legacy of this exhibition. Uh, so, what, what, any questions? All we do, I'm logging up all the questions yeah. to, for, I mean, she can't do everything. <laughs> I mean, it's amazing uh, that there is no we'll biography. Try. I mean, I know Richard the, the, Richard, the I, the photos, Richard's is the, but it's not a the full one, only bi one. biography yeah. at all. It's amazing, given that, yeah. you know, um, when you think of the great figures of science and arts in, in, in the 19th century, it's extraordinarily interesting because of the reach that it has, isn't it? And, and the, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not even talking about his the range of publications that he made for so long afterwards. His influence in, you know, the books on China that he wrote. You, you, um, <coughs> even the technique of actually reproducing photographs well in a printed text. You know, rather because when he starts off, they're simply gluing the yes, limited that was, number of uh, yeah. print, prints into a book form. That's why. And then it, it the moved Fuchou to book is so so mm -hmm. short a print run. Mm -hmm. So his role in in the the development of the technology is fantastic. Mm. His role in letting the Victorian public, through his later books, see what China was like. Mm. Um, uh, he's a major, major figure mm. in 19th century culture, isn't we he? We should he's mention done. that um, the time around just before the print of Victoria photos, the Street Life of, Life of London, yeah. which exposed the, uh, the homeless immigrants and the street traders, very much like the yeah. decade before in China. That's going to be on show at the Museum of London yeah. um, in the autumn. Yes, yeah. I sort of, I, I went and talked, and they had no idea they had these, mm -hmm. but it's a wonderful set, so yeah. they will be showing some. Yeah, the portrait of the East End Poor is, an, is another yeah. amazing, it's amazing thing, which he published work. in fascicles, yes. first of all, before yes. it's published as a major yeah, a volume. Book. But yeah. um, uh, mm -hmm. amazing that he could have, done that in China and then come back to do it in his own backyard, I think. It's really mm. interesting, isn't it? And, Although and the London ones are not yeah. as good as the Chinese yeah. ones. Yes, they're, they're a bit <laughs> no, not so nice as the China yeah, ones. Yeah. And also there's this whole other uh, work at the Royal Geographic Society yeah, yeah. of his role as a teacher yeah. of uh, travel photography. Yeah. That's a whole other dimension. So there's so yeah. many, many... It's a great so, biography to be written, so, isn't so there? Today, yes, I yeah, totally yeah, agree. Yeah. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So, Hmm? Thank you so much. Oh, mention his grave, yes. Can you tell us a little bit about the, the economics of this? Because it, it seems that he's quite different from people like Beato, who set up studios in Rangoon, it's very commercial. Hmm. But he, and he's not, he doesn't look like he was pre-funded by the RGS, like a lot of the no. RGS. No, no. no. Is it an investment that he capitalises? No, studio, studio photography. Well, he's, yeah. he's, it's, he's it's, built up a business from his first mm -hmm. uh, time in Penang, then in Singapore, then mm -hmm. in Hong Kong, and the business continues right up till he sells it before he goes on the Yangtze, you know, so uh, that's made, uh, made a lot of money. And he yeah. publishes books, you know, and he um, publishes, sells photographs, um, uh, charges society people for photography, you know, and, and I think it continues. So when he goes on his trips, he's, the, there's, he's got people working for him. So mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a, you know, you look at the Gazetteer for Hong Kong for the 1860, whenever it was, and he's there as a photograph. So, yeah. He, yeah, no, he's making good money, you know. Okay. And it's not expensive so, to go up, take a boat to Fuzhou and then stay in a monastery. Talk over there. Uh, all right, we, 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 let's move and continue to chat over there. But let me just mention that um, every exhibition we find out something new. And this time, someone approached us, call, call us to say they dif discovered John Thompson's grave, which his own family didn't know anything about, in Tuting at the Stratton Museum. The grave has, the gravestone has killed over moss grown. So we've just recently pulled together a committee and we are fundraising. It's not the money that matters, the matters that all of you can then get, stay connected and do justice to, you know, at least show something for, about his legacy. So there's some leaflets out there, you can always email us. Thank you. Let's, let's move over there. Let's, oh, you've got the flyer. Yes, thank you.